Good evening, everybody. I'm very honored to introduce Saskia Sassen, who is delivering the inaugural keynote lecture for the Intellectual Commons Symposia on the Globe. Since it is all new, allow me a few more minutes than usual to introduce to you first the Commons idea, second, the Symposia on the Global, and then Saskia Sassen. The idea for the intellectual commons came out of parallel conversations with faculty and students. During one of the weekly faculty open houses last year, and following a very lively debate among faculty from urban planning, architecture, and the media lab, Anne Spurn suggested that we bring these discussions to the open. In parallel, and during the monthly lunches I've been having with students from across the school, a recurring complaint has been that, and I'm quoting, SAP does not have common activities that bring the students and faculty from the different departments together. So here we are. At a time when MIT is building bridges across schools and disciplines, we can no longer define our intellectual scope primarily at the scale of micro units. This reflects neither the ambitions of the new generation nor the nature of the problems that the world is leaving at our doorsteps. At a time when digital communications are growing and more than half of our time is spent online, the need for direct interaction has become all the more vital. And the vitality of the school, a community invested in shaping better commons for the world, from the environment to cities to public spaces and public art, our vitality depends on our ability to exercise our collective imaginary to define our own commons. This is what we are starting tonight. We are building our intellectual commons. And it is a befitting coincidence that we are starting this on the same day as we have announced the four finalists to design our physical commons <laughs> at the Metropolitan Warehouse. For the intellectual commons, the format we are trying out is to invite a keynote speaker to reflect on a meta theme, the global, that is topical and that affects most, if not all, of our individual pursuits. The lecture, tonight's lecture, will be followed subsequently by two symposia with the speaker and faculty discussing aspects of the theme that bring it closer to our own fields. The hope is at the end of each of these themes, we will produce a white paper, maybe a white book, a book that delineates something of a shared understanding, perhaps more of a common sky than a common ground, under which we pursue together our different inquiries. Some ideas that have been suggested for the symposia to follow are the city after smart technologies, the climate and human rights, and tonight's theme, reconsidering the globe. But if you have other ideas, please feel free to email me. Tonight's symposia start with Saskia's lecture and the theme is the global. And it is really Professor Mark Josenbeck who has been instrumental in shaping the theme of the global and who will be moderating the discussions between the faculty and Saskia, one on October 9th, which will be on acad academia and, the ag and agency in the era of the global, and that will include Professors Rania Rosen, Jason Jackson, Gabriella Carolini, Arendam Data, and on the, 15th, on, on the 15th of November, on development in the era of global age, Ethan Zuckerman, Nasser Abbat, Brent Ryan, Janelle Knox-Hayes. Work has been really instrumental in this as well, having shaped a new global historiography and history of architecture through his own work, but also through the Mellon grant that he has received, which is building a collaboration among historians of architecture across the world. On the global Saskia, it has a long history at our school. Since its beginning, we have been invested in building a broader, geographically and socially broader, conception of modernity. We have also been invested deeply in using technology to advance social, economic, and urban development across the world. Today, when we hear the term globalization, we usually see in front of us one large sweeping economy and new technologies connecting everybody. Globalization is already here, we are told. Dominant, singular, big, really big, so deal with it. Much of the research on the world's financial institutions, of demographic flows, commerce, and urbanization is based on understanding and coping with this big mammoth. And here at MIT, we are as well. 
I cite very few examples, but the work of Janelle Knox on carbon taxing, of Jason Jackson on migration, of the Aga Khan program, Nasser Abbad, Azraq Jamia on urban, on refugees, of the Media Lab on information flows and civic media, Miho Maziru on urban and global risks, to name a few examples of how we are trying to tame this mammoth. Another conception of the global you'll find here is that of the international. The world as a collection of nation states from where local identities dictate politics, culture, economics, but also modes of interaction with the larger world. The international world's protocols may have been set by the Bretton Woods organizations, but they persist today. And this international world's protocols have also organized the world into developed and underdeveloped and proposed speciously that technology and its rapid transfer will accelerate the process of development if you only follow the models that we tell you to follow. This exhausted and contradictory view of the world has, however, built into it conceptions of advancement, democracy, and emancipation, which remain, according to many of us, indispensable. So towards this goal of recalibrating the pursuit of global development, I can cite a few examples in the work of Gabriella Carolini, Daniel Wood, Bish Sanyal, Balikrishnan Rajakapol, Jim Westcote, but also the Spurs program here. There's also the other physical global, the planet, the geological one, the ecological one, the one that we quantify and measure, the one that is in danger, that we worry about every day, and for which we are looking for doubles, twins that exist light years away, just in case this one fails us. The conception of this global is moving closer to our work, as I can cite as examples, just very few again, the work in Building Technology Group, Urban Mobility Group, the Environmental, Initiative, Environmental Solutions Initiative, and the work done on the future of agriculture and industry by Caleb Harper, Neil Gershenfeld, and Skylar Tibbetts, or work done on imagining global futures by Rania Ghusun and the Center for Real Estate but also the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. But finally, there is the global as humanity, the world that is inhabited, that is there to share, to reflect, and report on how unique experiences sprouting everywhere produce unique knowledge. But to always work together to make these unique experiences add up to a larger shared understanding of humanity, to create a framework, a constantly changed framework, like Heraclitus' river, that is receptive to these experiences and respectful of them no matter how far away they come from and no matter how strange. I cite again here a few examples, the work on design across scales by Neri Oxman and Mijin Yoon, Liam O'Brien's experiences of estrangement, Anna Miliaki's alternative utopias, Iyad Rahwan on global citizenship, Todd Macover on empathy, work on disobedience, incarceration, human rights, but above all, our investment collectively in shaping the ethics of the global. This is the global according to our school and what we aspire to do better with your help. What is unique about your work, Saskia, on the global is that you help us understand its most graphic manifestations like cities, migrations, and inequalities as battlegrounds of competing claims and of competing conceptions of the global. And what is uniquely pertinent about your work is how you remain at once outside this world and inside it, as a true cosmopolitan, whose main right of citizenship in this cosmos is to be a stranger at home. It is this strangeness that brings us together as human beings, and here in this room as architects, talking to planners, to social scientists, and to artists, and it is this togetherness that sets the tone of our gathering around you tonight. Saskia Sassen? is the Robert Lind Professor of Sociology at Columbia University and member of its Committee on Global Thought, which she chaired until 2015. She is a student of cities, immigration, states, and the world economy with inequality, gendering, and digitization as three key variables running through her work. Born in the Netherlands, she grew up in Argentina and Italy, studied in France, was raised in five languages, and began her professional life in the United States. She is the author of eight books, including The Canonical Global City, which coined the term, and a whole classification system associated with it, and 
among many others, more recently, expulsions, brutality, and complexity in the global economy. Together, her authored books are translated in over 20 languages. She has received many awards and honors, among them Dr. Honoris Causa, the 2013 Principe de Asturias Prize in the Social Sciences, election to the Royal Academy of the Sciences in the Netherlands, and made the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et d'Etres by the French government. I hope, Saskia, that one day you would add to your long list of much-deserved accolades that you delivered the first of the Intellectual Commons lectures at MIT, where and how is the global constituted? Please join me in welcoming Saskia. Wonderful. Can you repeat your introduction again? I really enjoyed that, all the good things you said about me. <laughs> uh, well, it's an enormous pleasure uh, to, to be here with you, to, to be part of this initiation of a whole new project, which really sounds quite extraordinary. More universities should be doing this. Um, and we had a nice chat, you and I. You changed my my alignment a bit. So um, uh, Hashem asked me, so how, how did the, this global era, now I thought we were talking about this global era, huh? it come about, how was it enabled? And so uh, that is what I want to talk about because there are two issues. One is there is a sort of invisibility that often attaches to major uh, transformations in complex systems. It's not in your face. You know, so what are the shifts that have happened? And, and of course, the, the other aspect is that changes have happened, but a lot of stuff is more or less the same, a bit worse, a bit better, you know, it varies a bit. And so, so what I really want to focus on, and this is an unusual way of talking about the glo of globalization, is what enabled this current modality of globalization. Inevitably, I have to also focus on quite a few negatives, because negatives have happened. And so um, I just want to, I want to alert you that there is a lot of good stuff, like I do a lot of work with, uh, with activists around various kinds of issues, you know, people trafficking, etc. They are very glad, very often, that there is a kind of, there are these invisible bridges that allow them to connect from the Netherlands to Argentina, et cetera, either via email, but also via mutual visits. You know, there, there, there are some very, very positive things. There also are some very negative things. So again, I, what I want to emphasize, this is not describing the global so much as describing what, or trying to understand what are the conditions that enabled this particular mode. Now, in my reading, and I was very interested in what you said, uh, um, so in my reading, this is something that begins to happen in the 19, by, by the 1980s, a ground has been laid. Uh, it's not that it is all executed, but something has changed. Now, I did quite a bit of research, you know, over the decades, uh, I have been around for quite a while, um, in order to understand what enabled it. Now, a first, a first point for me is, um, has to do, it, it happens in the, in the 1980s, and to put it in shorthand, though these are complex vectors coming from many different angles that produce an outcome, but to put it in very simple terms, by the 1980s, we have deregulated, we have globalized, and here the term global versus international, we, we can return to that. Um, and we have also created particular actors and <coughs> operational spaces that enable certain of these actors to become extremely powerful. And high finance is one of those, and I, I will address uh, that, but there are others. Um, so I want to isolate a very sort of, if you want, specific set of issues. And again, I want to thank you for framing it that way, you know. What enabled, in other words, this is not describing globalization, this is asking the question, how come that it could develop the way it has, that it could emerge? 
what enabled it. Now, um, I just wanted to, to um, uh, so, so a key proposition, a key sort of uh, rule almost for engaging in my work on, on globalization is the notion that uh, complex systems change in very particular ways. And in other words, not everything changes. It's not always self-evident what is changing and how it has changed, but the change happens. So they don't have to change everything. This is very important in order to produce a change. So I repeat, by the 1980s, those changes were in place. And it had to do with deregulation, it had to do you know, with a, with a whole ver privatization uh, and with the opening up. So I want to sort of run you through a few of these items. You know, what is it that changed? And, and I repeat, the image that I really would like you to sort of hold in your, your mind is that, that a complex system can change by shifting certain capabilities, not everything, certain capabilities to another organizing logic. So there is a tension there between the organizing logic that enables that and this insertion of more and more elements. When I look at how the global condition, which today is you know, characterized by a set of very specific conditions, possibilities, <coughs> etc., how that happened is, in other words, what I want to show you. Now, I should say that it seems to me that in doing this type of work, um, and professors don't like me saying this. I find that a lot of the methods that we have, I must say that your university is so different, you know, but your standard, like I'm at Columbia University, which is a very good university, et cetera, but you know. So uh, th there is a set of very standard modes, certainly in the social sciences, of doing the proper research. We have wound up, if I may take this minute, uh, producing silos, which 20 years ago, exciting, great stuff was added. By today, very often, the silos, you know, the new things that are, are a bit irrelevant, you know, not too much is happening, and reproducing this and that and that, and no, I don't like that. So, so I, I have generated this setting for my work, which I call before method. I love that. I don't know why I love it, but there it is. And so, rather than the center of the paradigm, I want to be at the fuzzy edges of the paradigm, because that's where it's a bit looser, that is where new elements can arise, et cetera, et cetera. And to give it a pretty title, analytic tactics, or a tactical analytics. You know, English is like my sixth language, so I'm not that great in English. I don't know if this is better or a tactical analytics. Some of you can tell me afterwards. Uh, now here are, so, so in other words, tactical, huh? that is a critical word in there, but in analytics. Now here are some of these tactics, right? So the need in certain situations, vis-a-vis -vis certain questions, to actively destabilize stable meanings. What is the middle class today? It has divided into two. One that is much richer than they ever thought they would be, and the other one, that is poorer. You know, you can just run through a whole range of issues. You know, what is the economy? Do we have an economy? You know, a lot of you, you get what I'm saying, right? So the need to destabilize these supposedly stable meanings. Secondly, what do we see when we don't go to the heart of a strong proposition, but we actually go in the shadow, sort of the penumbra around it? What can we see? That to me is a favorite. It got me into trouble. I should alert you that my first book, I was thinking already like this, got rejected by 12 publishers. No, no, great stuff, but where does it fit? No, no. So, you know, I was a, and I never gave up, I, even if it was going to take 85. That was my first book. So you pay a price sometimes when you step outside. No, I just <laughs> want to make sure that I had that. So in the shadows of powerful explanations, I remember, so the question of the territorial, and I'm going to address that a bit uh, here. The, the territorial, you know, we have, we have encased 
that wonderful term into sort of sovereign national territory. That is a very common notion of it. And I think actually that what we are seeing are a whole bunch of emergent territorialities. And some of them actually cut across uh, 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 borders, international borders, with great ease. But what I'm particularly, and, and, and I, I, I'm very interested in that, but I'm also very interested in the fact that there are territories inside national sovereign territory that are very partial. They just occupy a little bit. And so high finance is one example that I want to talk about. High finance needs territory, but it's a certain kind of territory. But by God, that where they insert themselves, it's a huge physical operation and of course digital operation. Do they care about all kinds of other things? No. But you can say the same thing about, I like to, to mention this example, about human rights activists who want to go digging and seeing there are buried bodies in that terrain. They'll get a permit to access a country. They're not interested in the country. They're interested in a very specific site where they suspect that people will, were killed, etc., etc. So when you begin to look at it that way, then you see that the territorial contains within it a whole variety of very, very specific territories, terrains. And that to me is also a marking feature of this current um, period. Now, expulsions, when I, when I use this term, I was really interested in expulsions that happen inside a country because they're happening inside countries. And so it's not so much about we expel the migrants, we expel, that is of course a very serious history, very tragic history, what's happening. <coughs> but I was interested in the expulsions that happen inside. And I give you two examples. I, I covered a very, very broad range. And to me, this is all part of understanding this current modernity that for me really is sort of established in vitro at least and then takes off in the 1980s. Huh? Um, so, um, well, maybe I should, so, well, let me give you two examples then. One is long-term unemployed people. At some point, they become invisible. They become invisible to the eye of the law, not invisible to our eyes, but the eye of the law, the eye of the system, whatever, right? They are still there, the bodies are there. But in terms of having a right to a job or to a payment while you don't have a job, they don't exist anymore. When you begin to look at some of our current conditions, inside countries, in other words, you see quite a bit of that happening. That, and so the language, the categories, the laws capture only part of what's happening. And so invisible, they're not invisible because they're material to our eyes, but they're invisible to the system. So by expulsions, I mean that kind of fact that can also go, of course, international, but I was particularly interested in capturing it in the inside of a country, because that is a kind of division. I hope that that, uh, that was clear. And then finally, the making of it all. Clearly, <clears throat> the making of it all is a very partial way of putting it. I mean, you know, uh, because there are so many other conditions that are in play when you have an outcome. But I just wanted to emphasize that moment of making. And, and one of the reasons is I'm engaged in a project with my son, who is absolutely a crazy uh, artist. And, um, and he sort of asked me, this went back quite a while when he was still quite young. Uh, he said, but uh, we do so much stuff that is so simple. It takes simple tools, it takes, and, and, we, and we do it so badly. Can't we, with simple tools, actually also do stuff? That is, and so here we have sort of, this is a one, one uh, and colonizing the scale and niche clearly is, a, is, is an ironic title. Huh? Now, I want to start with a few instances, since I would love to sort of elaborate on all of this, but I want to just give you a few cases now that capture this notion of what were the actors, what were the initiatives that actually enabled 
other actors to generate, and in this case I'm going to talk about the negative, some of the negative conditions that we see as part of our current history, you know, this history that begins this, this particular global era. Now, how many of you have know the term vulture funds? Nobody? Yeah. Okay, I see a few people. Okay, so the vulture funds are one example. I'm going to start just with the, with the empirics, and then I will ex explain what it is. Now, I want you to know, so this is a, th these are, I can't say that vulture fund is a term of art, you know what I mean, I can't quite say that, but it is pretty much an accepted term. And vulture, poor vultures, you know, I don't know that they're that bad, but anyhow, the vultures got stuck with that. So, anyhow. so Panama, um, here's this, one of these sovereign funds that are the vulture funds. Uh, they, um, they buy the debt, these are countries that have debts. Debts, moreover, when a country has a debt, it is recognized, you know, as, okay, this is a country, so we have to handle it very carefully, blah, blah, blah. So they purchase it for Panama. This was the first one. That's the first experiment that they did. 17.5 million. Then they took the sovereign, the government of Panama, into a commercial court in New York, and that, nobody thought that that could happen because that was totally against the rule because a sovereign debt is a protected debt. You don't take it to a regular court. And they got it for 57 million. Here, are, they have had 12 such very successful with all kinds of countries around the world. Panama was rather modest, so was uh, Peru, you know, but they have also done very rich. And of course, there is the famous Argentina one that they won, they bought for 48 million, they wound up getting billions. So this, what I want to emphasize here, this is an enabler of a certain kind of financial operation. The brutality of it, the in your face, you know, because there are, there's a lot of great law that says the sovereign needs to be respected, why? Because when the sovereign has a debt, it can affect a whole people. You understand that principle, right? Now, what is astounding about this, this, uh, this particular case, Elliot, very aggressive, very successful, that he, he just threw himself there. The notion of taking it to a sovereign, taking a sovereign debt, or a sovereign being, you know, demanded that pay, etc., into a commercial court was unheard of. Now, just for those of you who like this kind of stuff, so, Suing a sovereign in a U.S. court, okay, this is more of the same text, is in violation of some very old rules. When it's like very old English. I had the hardest time understanding what they were talking sometimes. But pari passu. So this, the, the, the 2012 New York court decision on Argentina further reduced the standing of sovereign debtor. You see, what this commercial operator succeeded in doing is unsettling the whole standing of a debtor, a, a sovereign debtor. So this is pretty big stuff. I don't know if people can follow it. And so the other famous violation is champerty. So I love this old uh, English language. Uh, now, basically the judges who took the decisions in commercial courts to take on the debt of a sovereign, they were innovators is a kindly way of putting it but really they, they, they contributed to a sort of, why is sovereign debt special debt? Because supposedly it affects the people, right? It affects a whole population, etc. So with very practical, very elementary tools, a space was created for a certain kind of actor to conduct himself uh, in a way that was a bit different. And then it goes like that. Now, second element, high finance. So I want to move very quickly in here. So one way of framing it, sort of forget that I said high finance. What is the steam engine of our epoch? That which can change a lot with a minimal intervention and does not necessarily need to have everybody changing. And so the steam engine, of course, was that, right? The steam engine uh, changed a lot. It didn't change everything. Most operations around the world were not you know, 
executing that. Now, so one way of putting it is then that which can make a new ordering, what can decide what is in and what is out. And this again, this is another enabler of a certain kind of globalization, which is, I always like to call it extractive, like high finance is in a way an extractive sector. So here I give you, and so it's high finance. Here I want to give you an example. Oh, that's right, I can walk around, right? Yes. So, so, um, so look at this curve growth, look at this. So this is in 201, it's under a trillion. And six or seven years later, it's 62 trillion. So when I see that kind of growth curve, I ask myself, well, what else? I checked it out, couldn't find anything. That's a very sharp growth. Those 62 trillion, this is right before the crisis, right? This is 207. Those 62 trillion were much more than global GDP of all the countries in the world in that moment. Number three, those 62 trillion were just 10% of the value of finance as measured by outstanding derivatives, which is the basic measure. So you stand back and you say, well, what am I seeing here? What is this? Is this money? No. I went and checked. The currencies issued by all the central banks in the world, mind you, an incredibly wobbly measure, you know, because some of these and, uh, doesn't reach that at all. I mean, it's just much lower than the 600 trillion of value of the whole of finance. This is just, this is just 10%, okay? This is a particular instrument. So the question then is, when we talk about high finance, what are we really talking about? What is that? What is that? Now, here's another element. So these are just elements that I'm putting on the table that together begin to reduce, begin to erode the power of the sovereign, which is one thing. Many sovereigns deserve to have their power reduced. I'm not a romantic about this. By sovereign, you mean what I, you know, I see a sovereign government, right? Um, uh, so, and, and, and create a new sort of uh, assembly, a semblance of, uh, of capabilities, of possibilities, of where do we put our money, what do we do? Now, back to this one. When Bernanke, the formal head of the central bank in, uh, in the United States, when he stepped down, he said all kinds of things, blah, blah, blah. And then he said, and there, is, there are two intractables. One was, uh, and he coined, that is not my language, dark pools in finance. I mean, just stand back. And, the head of the central bank of one of the most powerful countries in the world, dark pools, what is that? Anyhow, so he explained also what it was. He said, most, up to 70% of our financial trading is happening in dark pools in finance. These are privately owned pools, there are long waiting lists, they're owned by banks. So the, the stock market, which is the public moment of this, you know, Stock market is like a little little toy hanging in there that can enable this. But the real stuff is happening in privately owned networks with long waiting lists of other banks and other whatever entities who want to gain access to it. Now, these are enabled, the few things that I've told you so far, these are huge enablements of a certain sector which happens to be extraordinarily powerful. Now, two little points, very quickly. In my reading, high finance has played a critical role. It has functioned a bit as, uh, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the, of the old machine. <laughs> but, um, but high finance is brilliant. It's algorithmic mathematics. It has nothing to do with economics in terms of the formula, the established field, uh, or with microeconomics, which is the most developed part, you know, of standard issue economics. It's algorithmic mathematics. 
Goldman Sachs, when you used to enter there, a hundred secretaries, you know, sitting around sort of in the back room, what they call the back room. Today, it's a hundred physicists, and I'm not blaming the physicists, clearly. But this is another world. So the traditional bank is commerce. We all need it. It sells money for a price, okay? You know, fine, it's good. They can get a bike instead of using a... Well, this is something else, what is happening now. This is really, and it must be understood that way. Now, I use a language, I, I can be rather brutal. Um, so I say that this type of high finance is actually an extractive sector. Once it has grabbed, it's like a mine. Once the mine has taken out what can be taken out, it's done, finished, doesn't care anymore. And high finance functions that way, whereas a traditional uh, a bank is commerce. You know, you want to keep on, you want the sons and daughters to do better than the parents and because these are the clients. So that is a very reasonable proposition, whereas this kind of stuff is not so reasonable. Now, the value of high finance today is extraordinarily, you know, it reached at some point about six months ago a quadrillion dollars. We use that measure, you know, money, but it's not money, you understand. When you just look at, as I said, at the currencies issued by all the central banks in the world, it doesn't reach that figure. So this is something else. It's a capability, a dangerous one. I always say, you know, if we could just materialize some of that stuff into new housing for poor people, whatever, but that doesn't quite happen. Now, here is another element. This is one. Now I want to describe two experiments to you. They were not designated as experiments. But they both, in a way, had a similar, a similar outcome. So this is the famous subprime mortgage. You have all heard of it, right? Now, a subprime mortgage, which really is an instrument that is traveling. It's, it's in Europe now. It's way till it hits China. So these are, if you want the French term, you know, filières, sort of global filières that cut across, make a path, and they enter other domains. Um, now, this mortgage, now here is, is a, this subprime mortgage was a massive organization. Over 16 million contracts were signed by modest households, mostly, almost all. And basically, uh, it was not about providing housing. It really was not. It was something else. It was really about producing, and, and this is the image, a field of materialities, those little houses. The instruments that were making the money off those mortgages were instruments that were, through algorithmic math, had become materialities. They were not buildings, the houses, the little, nothing of that something very, very different. So this is an extraordinary story. As you know, uh, millions of people, right? 14.5 uh, million lost their homes. Some are still living in there, but they basically lost their homes. And again, I'm hoping that I communicate with you. The notion was that, number one, what I already said, you can have a mortgage just signed. You don't have to pay anything. They wanted the signatures. They wanted the contract. And, um, but it was not about housing. It was because the high investment circuit said, no more derivatives. We, we are being sold derivatives if we are in that business, not the high investment circuit. They're done with derivatives because these derivatives, long chains, you don't even know where it started. So they said, the high investment circuit told the bankers, Give me asset-backed securities. Well, in the United States, a lot of assets, material stuff, has been, it has been done, it has been bought, it has been used, etc. But what you did have were these 15 million households that didn't own a house. So, algorithmic mass. We see the building or the little house, the product, is somewhere else. 
It's all a field of materialities, a toilet, a wall, no matter, asset-backed securities. That's how a lot of money was made in those 10 or so years before the crisis really hit. But those who pulled out in time, I'm talking about the big investors, they made money. But the point was asset-backed security. We are now in phase two. That, in my reading, was an experiment. Now we're in phase two. Okay, here is how it entered. This, is, this instrument has now entered Germany, uh, Hungary, etc. Now, oops, I don't have that other image, I see. So what, I, um, so what has happened, phase two is buildings. Okay, has any of you been in Manhattan lately? Have you seen big towers that are empty? Okay, that's phase two. Under certain conditions, they, and this is happening in London, it's happening in quite a few parts of the world, yeah, but sort of mostly the West. Uh, an empty building can now deliver more profit than an occupied building. Why? And we're talking luxury towers now, not the little modest houses, because it functions as an asset-backed security. So these are major enablers of a certain version of what is the global condition. Uh, there are also very good things in that global condition. Uh, now, I wanted, to, I wanted to show you just another little, can everybody see this? So look at this. Um, where are we? So take, look at this ratio, look at the title. By the way, this is IMF data, st staff papers, you know that that is our data. We should be using it. We can access it for free. Ratio of, of, what is it here? Of household credit to personal disposable income. Did you get that? Right. So look at this. Hungary, 2000. This is, this is a critical period, especially for Eastern Europe. That's why I have that example here. Of this transformation of entering, you know, the Western world, etc. So you have Hungary, 11%. Uh, ratio of household. At that point, the United States already was over 100%. Um, and then you have Germany look so stable, 70, 70, 70, 70. How they do it, I don't know. But they're one of the few. So there, and then you have Hungary, 11%. Five years later, almost 40%. Now, I love that language of credit. Credit is debt. You understand, right? It's not a gift. It's debt. So when I see this kind of stuff, I ask myself, um, well, who owns that debt? Now here you have, in the case of Hungary, uh, in the case of Hungary, I can see, in the case of Hungary, oopsie, up to 40% of that debt is owned by German, Austrian, and, uh, and Swiss banks. I don't know why the Germanic vector is so active there, but um, now, that's not good. If that debt is owned by a local bank, the local bank can make some money, right? But under these conditions, no, it all goes, it's extractive. It takes whatever the capacity to pay an interest rate payment of those households, it takes it out. That is not good. But that has enabled the banks. Now, in short, the notion of extractive sectors that I'm talking about, they can extract even from modest households. Now, what I have presented to you right here are some of the most negative impacts of globalization. And I will say that high finance is deeply involved in that stuff. Um, and I have some stories that that I, by chance, ran into some truckers who, this happened a few years ago, who, uh, who were saying, I don't know, but we keep moving all this. I'm now telling you a particular event. We keep moving all of this aluminum around. We just truck it from here, we truck it from there. Well, they were doing that for Goldman Sachs. I don't mean to hit on Goldman Sachs, but anyhow, maybe they have funded this building, I don't know. <laughs> Which is good, good, that's good. Let them build, let them put the money in buildings. But anyhow, so Goldman Sachs was having these truckers 
move from one big, whatever you call it, storage thing to another, these huge aluminum sheets. Uh, and the truckers say, we don't know what's happening here, we keep moving it around. Well, what do you think it was? By creating this other world, <laughs> they were creating a crisis, not among the people who were actually going to need the aluminum, see the big construction companies, but that intermediate sector where the financial is in play and you can make a lot of money just out of running, you know. And so it created a bit of a crisis uh, of confidence. So the, the intermediate, th think of this, this capacity, you know, to manipulate, to make grow, etc. It's an intermediate sector that is hanging in there. And, and, um, and that is what it was. They were taken to court, uh, so Goldman Sachs, and they had to pay 5.3 billion, uh, whatever, you know, multa, we say in Spanish, multa, you know, that you have to do something. But, um, but that was nothing for them. But you understand, you understand how ridiculous that is or not? Can you imagine all these brilliant <laughs> people? <laughs> Anyhow, but I just wanted to, to give you this kind of stuff because it really is, oopsie, it really is part of the story. Now, um, I want to add yet another element here. And um, unstable meanings. So, yeah, just read that, all of that. <laughs> and who of you has, this is in the public domain, okay? I only show stuff how it got to the public domain. It's a totally different question, but it is. Um, how many of you have seen this map? I always get the same answer. Almost nobody, if anybody. Anybody? Anybody is not here. Okay. So, so, so these are a set of buildings all over the country. By the way, this is, huh? This was published in the Washington Post. Uh, so it, this is not, you know, and top secret America, etc. These are all buildings that are gathering the information about all of us and about whoever, you know, if your grandmother is also passing by, she's in there too, no matter that she might be close to death, but she's going to be in the system. I think they have far too much data to use it, so. But um, in Washington, blah, you know, it's like a vast, vast material infrastructure. Now, Mike, the question that I then immediately get, sort of the transversal question is, so we have all those buildings, we have all those capabilities, could they be transformed into a positive, you know, that has to do with the quality of the water, the quality of whatever, something positive. And I keep hoping that that's a possibility. Now, um, so I just selected one. I have, and it goes on for pages, pages, pages. So who's dangerous? This is all in the papers there, huh? In the, you understand? Veterans. Dangerous. Uh, environmentalists. This is stuff that is absolutely shocking to me. Um, now, so let's move on to a final point here, which are these operational spaces. They mix lots of elements. And I think we have to begin to see the way national territory is actually disassembled into a whole variety of specifics that can include, like I said at the beginning, uh, you know, activists for human rights, etc. I mean, but, but um, now, partial insertions into national territory, this is where I started, remember, with the human rights. They cross multiple interstate borders. This also holds for major firms that are operating globally, etc. They recur in country after country, but are not necessarily framed by distinct national or international laws or by visible legal markers. They have their own logics. Now, I mentioned at the beginning high finance. It needs no matter how it depends on digital tech, I mean, it couldn't do you know, what it does. It also 
has these enormous material moments, right? The financial center has lots of buildings, lots of structures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so, um, but are not necessarily framed by distinct national or international laws or by visible legal markers. They have their own logics. And again, as I said, it also includes human rights activists. You know, it, it, it just includes a whole bunch of people. But this is also, these are all elements that are almost like infrastructural elements that are enabling, shaping, uh, strengthening, etc., some of the features of this current global era. They contribute to the making of geographies that include only parts of national territory. This to me has become a very important point, by the way. Uh, often very small parts, such as a city or a mine, right? So we have these huge national, and they're not always huge, but in my country it's certainly not a huge one, but so they, these, these large, you know, national sovereign territories. Inside of those sovereign territories are other kinds of territories that are getting shaped, that are very active, there are presences. Um, and they can be good or bad. Eh? That is why I started with that example. Human rights activists trying to establish that bodies were tortured, killed, etc., or financiers who just need these insertions. Um, and here, I think that also the poor and the powerless are part of these networks. And that's great. They may be immobile. So I've done quite a bit of work on on uh, human rights, no, not human rights, but sort of activists of all sorts, really, including human rights, like, who are really immobile. They're too poor, they're too persecuted, they couldn't travel. But having these technologies has meant all kinds of other networks. So, you know, a lot of what I described are capabilities, including this production of so much wealth, I always say, if we could only bring it down and materialize it into something positive, clean water, good housing for everybody, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that, I want to keep that hanging in there as well. But right now, what we do confront is a series of rather negative um, uh, conditions. Eh? I mean, now, the final, this is the final point. The territorial moment, eh? that, that moment that the, the territorial is in play, counts even for digitized sectors. And here I want to go back to when I was sort of beginning to do my, my writing of, of, uh, on some of these issues. It goes back a long time. Um, I was always interested in, in seeing how, how the disadvantaged, et cetera, could also benefit from some of these extraordinary capabilities. And I, my take is still that it could much more also enable, but it doesn't quite happen. So, so these spaces are marked by thick territorial, so back to these sort of these territorial moments uh, that count also for digitized sectors, right? So just think of a financial uh, setup and all kinds of others. So these spaces are marked by thick territorial elements, a financial center, a mine, a land grab operation, buying major properties in a foreign country. You know, these are all engagements with thick materialities. Even some of the most digitized sectors in today's global economy, such as finance, could not survive without some very material infrastructures. You know, so the digital really is in a continuous conversation with very material capabilities. Such as today's global economy, such as finance could not survive without some very material infrastructures and often massive concentrations of buildings. So this is something that, that a lot of people think the digital somehow it neutralizes all kinds of other things. It really, not necessarily. Uh, let's see. So this final element where I want to get to is that the notion of territory, the category territory, uh, which we have tended to associate with national sovereign territory, it's actually a very important concept, I think. It's very rich, and we, can, we should really use it, deploy it in far more ways conceptually than we do, which is basically national sovereign territory, you know, or some territory. Um, so I have been doing some research on these situated territories. I already alluded to that. Uh, these are, these, they are not 
generic spaces where any location is fine. These are very specific and many different types of activists, different types of operations, different types of businesses need them. And so given the dominance of the digital as a key explanation of what's happening, it seems to me extraordinarily important to not leave out the territorial. Huh? And of course, look at a university like, I mean, this is the kind of territory, right? The, the materiality of it. Uh, they're also, I mean, but they are weakly connected, these kinds of special territories that I'm talking about, to the larger cities or larger rural settings within which they exist. Uh, so the, say the financial center or where, the, where the, those who are searching tortured bodies are situating themselves. But, um, they are also weakly connected to the non-urban operations of the major extractive logics, mining, water, land grabs, etc., that are often the grist for a whole range of financial instruments. So we have sort of misaligned, I don't know if people are following this final, but I think this is a bit complicated, maybe not so clear, but, but, uh, but you're also smart, you will, maybe in an hour or so when you're drinking a good glass of wine, oh, that is what she was saying, that, it could be, it could be. Um, now, each of these types of operational spaces, you, do you have a sense of what I mean when I say operational space? So it's not a country, it's not a city, it's an operational space. Think of the, high, the financial center, think of a university, right? So many, 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 one way of thinking about the territorial is in terms of these operational spaces. So a big production in agriculture is also an operational space, right? Um, they connect in diverse ways, digitally, commodity chains, the land where the mining and water grabs are feeding diverse financial markets, etc. These operations contribute to the making of geographies that include only parts of national territories and cross multiple interstate borders. So the image here is a kind of emergent geography facilitated by the digital, facilitated by by all kinds of means of communication, by the, the wanting to also function in other different types of countries, etc. Very partial, but they are, they are alignments, they are, they are like roads, you know, like, but they are not roads, of course, but they are like that, that there is something that connects them. Now, when you look at very high-end sectors, they have done this very, very well. The, activists who are really fighting for the rights of desperate people, they have also done quite well. What has not, where this has not been mobilized is with sort of the broad middle classes, and you know, those who are comfortable and neither here nor there, and you know. But to me, these are the, these are the align, these are territorial alignments that mark this period and that are a, a signal uh, of an enablement by a global condition. You know, so globalization, it's not just globalization, it's also very, very structured arrangements. Um, and, and they vary, I mean, they're, they're, they have many different shapes, etc. cetera. Um, the actors involved, people, firms, networks, ships, mining machinery, network computers, think of extraordinarily broad, and they each have these very specific ways in which they use an ocean, a terrain, a ground, you know, but they are there, many, many, many. Um, uh, navigate these cross-border, what I'm talking about is that cross, that cuts across different countries, okay, who are, that are sovereign countries, etc. Navigate these cross-border geographies with only minor, if any, obstacles. So when I look at the global world, I see a lot of these filières, eh, as we would say in French, sort of where all kinds of stuff is happening. And, and I have been very interested in understanding how the poor are also doing that, I think. And that is a mixture of the territorial, inevitably, because of we, we have bodies, we need a terrain, and of course of the digital uh, that can enable that. Um, and do so openly, I'm now in the second one. Parts of their operational chains function within existing law. But there are new ways of using whatever the law enables you to do to, you know, to cut across. But other parts are beyond the law. 
they are novel types of operational spaces for which there might be little law. Now, the Panama Papers is a you know, famous background paper. It's one particular case way, way on this side of the broad range. You know, it, it, a bit of evasing, evading paying taxes and all of that. Um, and some parts of these, chain, of these new alignments, if you want, may well be in violation of existing law, but often in ways that are difficult to track. So I've been doing a lot of stuff on this part, and it's just amazing. Actors can get by with Im Im extraordinary violations of existing law, but it is, it's not like, I'm not going to respect you, law. No, no, it's like they, they just like take a little, I don't know if I'm conveying, this is a bit abstract the way I'm talking about, but actually these are quite material things. So to me, an, an issue that, we, we, that there is no time to address that here now, is this question of, um, of the law. So I'm quite persuaded by now that we need to get rid of a lot of old laws in a country like this, but also in countries in Europe. And um, China, I don't know, that's too complex, maybe too, too, too different. Um, but we should, we, and, and we should make new law. We really need to make new law to capture some of this. By capture, I don't mean it negative, okay? But, but I want to leave you with, I'm ending. A good time to end? Yes? Monsieur? Monsieur le Président, oui? Je peux finir? Uh, but sort of, what I want you to, to have in mind sort of as an image is that these filières, when I say that word, is, does that make sense to you? Do you understand it? Filières, sort of these rain, you know, that the world, this notion that we have of sovereign countries, you know, no, it's like transverse, transverse. And I have especially looked at the very powerful, like high finance, but also at the poor. And the poor often have a project, which we call survival. Huh? So they are, they are into that. And so, for instance, there is an association of Filipino women, and they are the best in, in Amsterdam, that is tracking everything that is um, um, uh, abuse of women, et cetera. You know, women who are basically uh, taken to serve in the sex industry, et cetera. I mean, there they are, you know. They have the church, you know. The Filipinos are very good in, because they, they know how to use the Catholic church also, and the Catholic church is all over. So, um, Final slide, I think, yeah. These spaces are globally recurrent. I don't know that that's proper English. What I meant to say is that they recur, you know. These are not original, oh my God, of the charts. No, this is daily life very often, whether it is of the financial system or whether that is, you know, of, uh, of activists. Globally recurrent, often but not always, interconnected operational spaces. They function as new cross-border geographies of centrality. Now, the centrality can both be the centrality of a very powerful sector, high finance, but it is also the centrality of activists around all kinds of issues who are poor and do not have power. Uh, there is a sort of standardizing aspect to them. So even if they are not interconnected in any active way, they are a recurrent condition. This is, it's like, you know, we eat every day. This stuff is also happening. In other words, when you look at the, at the globe, we know, highly visible, the rich, the powerful, they have created you know, all these connections, but it's also happening among modest people. But it happens there mostly because they need, they need it, they need that, for whatever reason. Uh, whereas it's prob probably the case that the, that the middle classes, the, the, you know, the, they're doing okay, everything is fine. They, this is, is something that has been found in quite a few studies. The middle classes are so satisfied, you know, that why bother with all of the rest? I don't know what it is, but, you know, it, 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 I find these two extremes so actively engaged. And then the, you know, if everything is more or less reasonable, then it doesn't happen. So there is a kind of creative spirit, uh, that is involved here. This is the final 
transnational, but bordered. Do you get that? In other words, those bordered spaces, bordered, you know, the borders are there, but they're not just simply the borders of the interstate. They're often borders, edges, that are made by the activists themselves, that they are not going to bother with the whole thing, they have very, very specific aims. And to me, that is a, actually, I must say, a very encouraging uh, element of this whole story, that um, those who are really a bit desperate are also getting to be very active. Um, including in this whole question of relocalizing production whenever we can relocalize it. You know, the, my famous image is, uh, do I really need a transnational to have a cup of coffee in my neighborhood? Do we know what I'm talking about? No, I don't need a transnational. <laughs> we right now have, if I need a computer, yeah, I need something that, you know, otherwise I have to go to the factory. But if I need for very basic sort of this recovery of place, this recovery, but in a way that connects you with other such efforts, so you're not sort of, you know, you, know, you feel actually that you're part of the world. There are quite a few, this is happening in the United States, it's happening in Hong Kong, it's happening in many parts of the world, certainly in Latin America. So, so the, one way of thinking about it is that this trans-territorial, uh, going very partial, but crossing borders that that is part of the lives, not just of the very powerful and of business, but also part of people. And what I find really, as far as I can tell, I haven't studied the whole world clearly, um, it is often the modest who make use of these tools in a way that the satisfied middle class, is, maybe they don't need it, they don't. So I leave you with these gentle thoughts. I started with a brutal case, and I'm trying to end with a gentle case. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Got here a bit late for reasons I won't go into, but I heard enough to know that this is a, a highly uh, relevant question. Um, are you familiar with a, there was a recent report issued called Towering Excess, <laughs> the perils of the luxury real estate boom for Bostonians. Uh, uh, the Institute for Policy Studies, a venerable entity that's in right. I Washington, mean, D.C., Chuck lot. Collins, who's been active in yeah. the Boston area. One of the key so-called takeaways in the summary is that of these are condo units that they focused on, 12 luxury buildings built recently in the Boston area, 1,800 units, 64% of which do not claim the residential exemption. These are people, these are, units may not even be available, no, may, nobody may be living in these. Right. Um, there's more detail, but is this something you might care to comment on? Yeah, Towering yeah. excess. Well, wow, towering, that's so good. So, so people have been commenting around also in Europe, you know, in quite a few cities, and it's now, I just spoke with two people who have found something similar in two African countries. They asked me to please not mention, you know, because they're small countries, of, I mean, small populations. Um, but see, I think that, that um, there are two things. There's a familiar, which is that you often buy a building to clean your money, right? So you don't need the building, but hey, you cleaned your money and so you got something out of it. You know what I'm talking about, right? When I say clean your money, I don't mean wash it. Huh? I mean, it's, you know, its origins are a bit dubious. But I think that besides that, there is something else. I mentioned it at the start, right? That an empty, we know that from New York City, we know that from London, I have a whole thing about that. An empty building can be more profitable than an occupied building. Why? Because by algorithmic math, we see the building. But it has nothing to do. It's an instrument. So it's materialities. Because again, the high investment sector has had it with derivatives, so one of the great options is an asset-backed security. Asset. I mean, 
do people follow when, I'm, when I speak like this or not, or is it a bit difficult? I'm so immersed in this whole thing that... Um, so, so we are seeing in Manhattan quite a few empty buildings, in London quite a few empty buildings, we're seeing it in Paris. And my question now when I see a building like that, I say, okay, uh, is it really just sitting there empty? Because remember it used to be that you had, you had dodgy money, you bought a building and you sort of then cleansed it because the law doesn't look at you know, the money that builds the building. But I think something else is now also happening. Now, it's quite rare. Huh? It's quite rare. It's a very uh, rarefied mold. But we know for a fact that it is happening. So that means, to me, that is sort of something that de-urbanizes the city. It's not good to have big buildings that are empty. You know? But hey, if they're delivering a lot of money, then. So it's weird. Yeah. Anybody else, a question? You mean everything was so terribly clear? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I know. Um, look, these are, these are very complex issues. Complex in the sense that there are so many vectors in play that it's not clear, you know, it could be in many different directions. But I do think that uh, I started out speaking about, you know, my question, how do complex systems change? So let me just use that abstraction rather than, say, organize the movement, the more concrete version of that. Uh, and I do think that we are, we have undergone a profound transformation that has meant, uh, for one, that the middle class is cut into two. One that is richer than they ever thought they would be, and the other one that is poorer than they thought they would. This is happening in many places. It's even beginning to happen in China, actually. So, so and we don't have the language, we're still sort of, a lot of the commentary is based on something that, a transformation that ha begins to happen in this country after World War II, right? When America really is ascendant. And it, it was good. I mean, we did create a very prosperous middle class. The working classes, you know, there was something there. We have left that behind for all <coughs> variety of reasons. Yeah? Uh, it's no longer there. The middle class is split. You see, it in, you see it in France, you see it in the UK, you see it in most of the European countries. So, and, and we cannot, we have not changed our laws, we have not changed our language, we have not changed our concepts to capture that difference. And this is one of my sort of, you know, my, my concerns that, so we don't have good language to capture, to describe, to say the top 1%, the top 1% is not the issue, it's the top 40%. The top 1% has always existed. But when the top 40% is in play and they are super rich, what does that mean? That before, where well, you had five families, now you have one person in a huge luxury, whatever. So, you know, it's many, many, very material, visible, etc. This doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, and, and we simply are not developing, I think, the, the language to capture that, what has happened. You know, we, it's sort of weird to me. I, I, I also think that as I said at the beginning, we need to throw out a lot of laws, but we need to make a lot of new law. You know, in this country, we haven't made a lot of new law. I mean, Elizabeth Warren did, you know, something, and, but we haven't made a lot of new law. And I think that is very serious. We really need to address all kinds of conditions. It's not that the law is a solution, but the law is something. The law makes it visible, the law, etc. right? And so, it's a tough one. I have been really surprised at this, especially this thing that we haven't gotten rid of some old laws and made a lot of new laws. I tend to get deeply involved with legal issues, so 
So that is sort of my take, you know, on, on that. It's not exactly an answer to your question, I know. So I, I, will, oh. I will comment and ask a question. I'm yeah. very pleased to hear your last answer about the role of law, because that's what I study. And I think I differ with you when you say that this was not about changes in law. Changes in law are ongoing all the time. So if you take your no, example yeah. of vulture capital, uh, there was a decision in a court that changed, it was an interpretation that changed the historic rights of sovereign debt. Yeah, yeah, that is So what that I, was yes. a particular decision. Yeah. There were other decisions, and they're ongoing now, in terms of not Congress, Congress writing laws, but regulations, which are every day being changed by administrative agencies, which are not always so in the public eye to be yeah. noticed. But let me just ask another question for the long-term system change, which you're talking about, and I wonder if you'd like to comment on this. I thought when you first began that you might, when you were looking for the enabling conditions for the global, I was thinking that the enabling conditions go back before World War II to the beginnings of the 20th century and the origins of standardization globally and the expansion of that after World War II little infrastructure changes that allow oh yes the, i completely the, agree the, with that allow completely. the transmission yeah. and exchange in yeah. ways we do not notice yeah. and so after world war 2 it be, it's the gat and then the wto what goes under the rubric of global governance which is not at the level of everybody watching but is buried in administrative agencies all over the globe. I completely agree with that. This is not, I'm sorry if I said that we need new laws, suggesting that no new laws had been made. I know, I know that there have been new laws. It's just that I, I think that we need more, and we probably need to get rid of some old Maybe ones. Maybe we just need different. Yeah, or different. different, yes, yes, absolutely. Different laws, exactly. So we are in heated agreement. Once. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Thank yes. you for your lecture. Um, I have a comment and a question. Yes. I think whereas you kind of leave off on a gentle note, um, thinking about operational spaces as a cultural worker and a person who has been invested in operational spaces, I am probably much more pessimistic <laughs> at the kind of picture you present. Um, but that's just a preface to a question that hopes to sort of invite you to imagine maybe and elaborate a little bit more when you say, when you talk about high, like high finance or vulture finance and the capabilities that this system has, when we know it is an acceleration and an abstraction and inherent in it and in its technology is violence that is, cannot be extracted from it, how does one imagine that these capab what kind of capability from that abstraction can actually be made material or actually be recuperated towards the good, let's say. But, and I don't expect, obviously, an answer or a layout or a plan, but rather I would just like you to perhaps expand because you sort of put it out there, the magnitude of high finance, and talked about capability, and you said you wish it could transform into houses for the poor, into better conditions. And from where I stand, I cannot imagine that possibility happening except with the complete collapse of a system that just won't collapse. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, this is a particularly brutal period we're leaving, uh, living, <laughs> leaving, we only were leaving it. So as I try to emphasize, there are a lot of negative forces in play. But objectively speaking, you know, we could bring that. So a fine high finance right now has a lot of capital sitting there that it doesn't know how to use. Now, I, yes, I'm a critic of high finance. I think that was clear, right? But 
why don't we have some sort of arrangement like you have in some countries, like the Netherlands has also changed some aspects in, in that regard, and say, look, that money is sitting, let's use it to clean up toxic dumps, let's use it to whatever, you know, all the things that we need to address. We have a vast amount of passive profits now, this is because they had, they have, there has been so much uh, profit making that now we have, that it's just sitting, I mean, what else are they going to do with it? You know, it's just sitting there. And that, so I, I think that we should absolutely um, engage that. Now, with the law, I'm not saying that that you know that we don't have all kinds of uh, uh, regulatory and legal uh, changes, absolutely. But I think we need more law on certain types of questions, including, for instance, why can't we free up that money? And and the way that money was also produced, that massive concentration of money. That's another issue eh, that is very problematic. So yes, for me, this is a a pretty serious situation. I think this is not a good period for most people uh, in this country. I think that, that, uh, that the, say, the post-World War II era, you really had the, uh, an expansion of the middle classes, an expansion of the well-organized and paid working classes. And to me, it is a question, how, how could we lose that much you know, on those two particular fronts and so much concentration of wealth at the top? So something did not function the way it could have functioned. Never perfect. Uh, and, and, and yes, a lot of regulations have been passed, etc. But still, we are not making the difference that I think should be happening. And it's not going to be easy to make that. I'm not saying that this is easy. This is not easy at all. Yes. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sounds good. I want to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the notion of situated territories in a way to bring the discussion back home to urbanism and architecture. And I ask it with a particular motivation. Your work on the global city challenged at that time uh, an understanding that technology, digital technology, the future of work was going to transform radically the way we live together. Dispersal, decentralization, diffusion. And you came back with a set of observations that showed that that's not what's happening. Right. It's concentration, density, yeah. adjacency, proximity, work. Yeah. A few years ago, uh, Marc Auger wrote a book called Marc Auger wrote a book called Le Non Lieu, the Non Place, which oh, yes. was a, a further observation at the architectural scale of what is the global producing in terms of spaces arguing that we are indulging in the idea of the non-place right. and that the architectures as hyper in their design and their signature as they are, are but an attempt to just counter, uh, fix this problem of placelessness, at, at least kind of in a very artificial, superficial way. You're now coming to say, no, 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 it's not about a non-place. The non-place you're not looking at it very carefully. There are certain characteristics and features to it that are very situated. I find that to be very provocative and pushing us to look differently than we have so far in, with the help of Auger and others. Can you say a little bit more about what situates the territory? What, what situates what, what? What situates the territory? What is situated about the, the territory ah, that ah, you're describing? I see, I see. Right, right, right. Um, well, it's, it's a mixture of elements, but one key element, let me put it that way, is the way we have deployed the concept of territory. It's like, you know, something much bigger than us, eh? than, than a person, than a family, than a group of people, than a group of activists, etc. And what I'm trying to say is that whether I look at high finance or I look at activists for human rights, actually, when there is that level of engagement. In other words, when there is no engagement, that's a totally different story, but when there is engagement, it marks very specific territories. And, and, and the notion of territory, you know, to me, it's, it's a complex notion. It has all kinds of embedded notions. It's not just terrain. Terrain is a very different word from territory. Um, 
So that is basically what I was trying to say. Now, what, what I keep being struck by is the extent to which it is very extreme situations, whether that is in terms of wealth or whether it is in terms of the struggle for survival, etc., of poor people, that that engagement is, can happen, you know, that it is at that intense level. And my comment on the middle class is, is that besides the fact that in my reading of the data they are split into one that is quite rich and one that is poorer than they expect it to be, it seems to be more difficult there. You know, that, that seems to be another sector of the population with a different history. Um, do, do I, am I answering your question a bit? Do you think the middle class live in the situated territories or are they excluded from them? They, they, I think they are a bit all over. They, you know, if you are poor neighborhood, poor Latino neighborhoods, I, I spent some time, the sense of a territory is very strong, you know, because it's their, it's their zone of, of protection where they, can, where they have friends, where they, they can make music, you know, whatever the things. So I, when I use this, this notion, it really is that there is something, you know, really substantive happening. And I see that also happening, of course, with, at a very high level. But then there is this vastness of an impoverished middle class, a middle class that was not expecting to be so impoverished. And there is something tragic there for me, you know, that, that uh, some, they lost something. And, uh, and, and they are not set up, I think, to do what, say, you know, if you're an immigrant community, hey, you, you just, you roll up your sleeves and you, you build, you, you fix your, whatever the hut you have or the little building that you have, right? The middle class is, they had a different trajectory. And I, I mean, I think, like I said, you know, it has split into two, one very rich and one that is poorer than they thought they would be. And we keep reading stories about this. It are very, very sad stories in many ways. I don't know what it is about the middle classes. I think it will change. Nothing is forever. But the middle classes, they felt always that they had earned what they got and that they deserved it. They played it by the rules of the game. And I wonder, I stand back and I wonder if that actually makes you into a kind of slightly passive actor. Because you do your bit and the system does its bit. And then we're all happy. And you know, when you're very rich or you're poor, it, it doesn't quite work that way. So the positionality, you know, the, the, the structural condition of the middle class is a bit different. But I think the middle class right now it has really split into two. And, uh, and it would be interesting to see how the more impoverished middle class you know, can sort of get it together again. OK? Yes? The last question, because we're oh. getting signals that we have. Oh, to... yeah, yes. You just shout your question. Yes. Um, so I'm not a wealth guy, not a subject, but it seems to me that many times um, the states that are representative of the people are quite happy to have these operations in place because they provide some benefit, um, even if it's out of scale with maybe the benefit that the operation receives. The operation, what, way, what operation were you talking about? Oh, so, um, Okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The financiers. Yes. Oh, yeah, the financiers, I mean, they're totally innovative. The law cannot catch up, you know, with them. But they also, I mean, uh, I always say, you know, you know, when our friends and our political representatives invite the financial system to come and explain a bid, etc. I mean, uh, our political classes don't quite understand all of it. And I always think that we should right now be developing a slightly different system where you have experts on all kinds of things also among you know the legislators 
Uh, you want some who are not experts at all, but you also want some, the question of water, like the whole scandal, you know, in, in, uh, in the Midwest, in, in Michigan, you know, on the war. I mean, we have a whole a long list of things that are not being addressed, and they should be addressed. And they, and they, are, and they are very, very powerfully negative factors. So I, I do think, I, I, and I think that is one routing that the middle class, the modest, the slightly impoverished middle classes might take. It's just the basic conditions of living, like water quality, you know, air quality, etc. cetera. Um, th that is sort of one, one set of issues that I think needs to mobilize much more, and, and we do need more legislation or, you know, rules of the game, whatever. All right, people, thank you very much for your questions and uh...